thank you so much for joining us and welcome to another episode of the Friday Film Podcast. This is brought to you by Magamba Network in partnership with Accountability Lab Zimbabwe as part of the ALZ Film Fellowship. And this is really just a workshop and fellowship to just try and mentor young independent filmmakers in Zimbabwe and also just help incorporate accountability in our storytelling and telling our stories how we want to tell them and with integrity and really just responsibly representing our issues. So today I am joined by the absolutely effervescent Tendai Shichitima. I am so happy to get to talk to you. Hey. Hey girl. How are you doing? I love the hair. What did you say? Effervescent. Yes. So bubbly and joyful. I feel and- like you you need to come with a dictionary. Like when you speak, we just get like the translation. Fizzy. <laughs> what are you fizzy? <laughs> Am I fizzy? <laughs> um, yeah, so whole big, mess, whole big mess out there doing the things in South Africa. And that's where you're based, right? Primarily. At the moment, yes. At the moment, yeah. And so that was a pretty big, a bold career move, mostly made, motivated by career, right? To, to stay here in South Africa? Yeah. Well, I came here, I mean, a lot of people, um, you know how it is, most mm-hmm. of the people who can afford to leave the country to go to universities uh, anywhere. Yeah. And so I, I came to South Africa in 2010 to start my undergrad degree at UCT and then what happened was while I was there in my second year my parents then moved to Joburg so oh. when I graduated I just kind of stayed otherwise I probably wouldn't I don't know if I would be here actually had my parents not moved to South Africa mm. so but it worked together for my good because then I was able to stay here and uh, experience the industry here and get work and just you know, build actually to actually build my acting career here. Yeah, uh, it would have been different had I been in Zimbabwe. Definitely would have been different. And it's nice just having everybody together, sort of you as a family, a, right? Yeah, yeah. There's less a sense of like being torn and like, oh, I should go home and like spend time with them while I still can, and all these yes. other things that you. So you, I know you only told your parents you wanted to be an actor once you, <laughs> maybe once you graduated. How did yeah. that go down? How did that conversation go? It's so interesting. I can't believe I told the whole world that, but I did that. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> so what happened, as you know, you know how it is with our strong, um, conservative, beautiful Mm. amazing parents who are just like there's no way you're going to be in the arts or like be an actress kind of vibes and I knew this I mean I hadn't even like put it to them as a I just knew that they wouldn't say yes so they had taken me to university to study media and journalism Mm -hmm. and so I discovered drama and film while I was at UCT and I decided you know what I actually really, truly love storytelling and film and drama. Oh my gosh, this is like what I'd love to do for a living. But Mm -hmm. what I'm not going to do is drop the media because my parents would freak out. So I just kept everything together. I kept the media, the film and the drama as a triple major. I did a triple major. And so when my parents would ask me, how's school going? I'd tell them media and journalism going well. I mean, my mom, I always say sometimes my mom, my mom would call me from, because at that time when I had uh, chosen my, my um, majors and everything, I, they were still in Zimbabwe. So my mom would call me, or even when she was not here in South Africa, she would call me. She'd be like, Tendi, how's it going? I'm like, ah, it's fine, it's fine. And she's like, you know what, Tendi, I was watching the news. I was watching the news and I could just imagine you as the news anchor reading the oh. news. Oh my gosh, Tendi, I can't wait until you are done with school so you can be a news anchor and you can be doing news and I'd be there like if only you knew (laughs) (laughs) but that's that's how it was like so I so they knew I was doing drama they knew I was doing film but they didn't know how seriously I was into it so I just kept everything and I didn't compromise like I decided you know what like there's no harm in me doing all three anyway yeah because it would give me a, a good perspective on the industry as a whole 
not just like film, but also with media, you know what I mean? So for me, it was like, yeah, why not? I'll do all three and my parents will be happy. And then I will tell them, you know, when I've thought about it more, you know, so by the time I graduated, I was very sure. And yeah. I only told them after I was very, very sure. And yes, I did tell them after. And they, they took it, they didn't take it too well. They thought it was yeah. a phase and that I would literally just get over it. But I never got over it. So that's how it went. <laughs> I mean, like people say, like African parents just need training. So like, go ahead, get that tattoo. Get just like, be jan and be jan. You know, like be smart about like what you did, like have the degree and by then it's too late to say anything about it. So yeah, but I also had another degree. Like I I feel like I didn't really cheat anyone. I just followed my heart, but still kept what they had wanted me to do. So I I you know what I mean? Like it wasn't like um, but but you know what I'll just comment on what you said about parents needing training. I think it's also just about exposure and like really understanding. I was actually at a, um, there's a young um, actress who's acting on Isono on BET um, and she's called Chioma. And Chioma hosted like a little mentoring uh, breakfast for actresses on Saturday last weekend and she invited me to go. And I was telling the young aspiring actresses there and I was telling them that, you know, the issue is really about um, just making sure that um, you do get the support of your parents because you don't, what ends up happening with young girls, especially sometimes I see in the industry is that because now you've gone against your parents mm-hmm. and you have no support, you're kind of stranded in the industry. And now you start doing the most shadiest things just to survive, you know, and it happens a lot where women, young women become vulnerable because they have no genuine support like there's and the thing is obviously our parents sometimes just don't generally understand but I think trying to negotiate and finding a balance between you and them to come to a a point of negotiation where you can agree and it's a win-win for everybody is is so important and I would I would say that that to anyone who's wanted to be in the arts like don't I know we love our acting and we love our arts so much that we would give up everything for it but you yeah. still need that support. It's so important because you don't want to be stranded and then have to do shady things just to survive. You know what I mean? Because now you don't have the support of the people who actually care about you and love you. Um, so anyway, just the, that's just an aside. I, I would definitely say support from people who love you is vital and important. And in fact, most people, well, not most, but some people who have that support actually end up doing much, much better than some people who don't. So I mean, sometimes that lack of support can be a motivating factor, but (laughs) you don't want everything to be driven from a negative space. You also want to have that support and be healthy while you're at it. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, it's definitely important because we do have an element in our culture of like, if a young person, especially like a young woman does something wrong, she's just cast out. And it's like, this is the time when she needs the most support. She didn't get herself pregnant. She didn't ask to choose a career you think is not lucrative or something and then mm-hmm. you do also fall into the trap of like while you're at re- rehearsal you're like no this is my chosen family it doesn't matter but then people go home for Christmas and now you're just you mm. and you don't have like you're saying that support and you end up in a lot of shady situations and it's so unfortunate like you're saying the shady situations is a lot of then very like predatory men in the industry come in and now try mm. to fill that gap of being a parent and then that's how you then get these issues of yeah. well, why did you go to his house and you're like well I, I always went to his house because he was like a father figure actually he mm. took me under his wing and then next thing you know it's a whole class action lawsuit against this person um yeah. but that's no that's really nice so now that you're on now that you're on netflix mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. has their has their perception changed i'm grateful brad like can we be honest <laughs> can we be honest is yes. just I I think I am so grateful for everything because um, as much as I was pushing, the funny thing is, I actually didn't ever expect when I when I decided to be an actress. Mm-hmm. I, I must admit, I was not hopeful. I don't think I thought my first big break would be a Zimbabwean production. Mm-hmm. Like I'll I'll be honest, I was yeah busy pushing to be in South African productions. 
I was pushing to be on international things. I was auditioning for this and that. And, you know, it wasn't actually until I made a conscious decision to look for work in Zimbabwe that I got cook off. Wow. And then that first thing that I got in Zimbabwe, that cook off film that I did, the first one is the one that actually ended up, it was such a learning curve for me. Like mm-hmm. I, I was mind blown. I was like, I can't believe that I was probably selling myself short by not um, embracing my Zimbabwean heritage and my yeah. where I come from, you know what I mean? Um, but it took me a while. I did get there at the point where I was like, not, I need to go and, and look for work in Zimbabwe because um, there were so many challenges um, with regard to getting work here. Um, so I was like, but I'm so grateful. I'm grateful that we're on Netflix. I'm excited about the future. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's still hard it's not easy yet but yeah. I'm so excited like a part of me is just like you know shake off all the anxiety and just mm-hmm. focus on what's ahead yeah yeah and definitely that's like a, a huge testimony to to you obviously like work very hard but sometimes a lot of the career is just blessings it's really just no one can see or tell you where in a year from now where things are actually going to be no matter how much you're planning how much you're just because even <laughs> Coco was from like what 2017 it is and three years later you just never know you just never know never know like <laughs> I can't emphasize enough <laughs> but you're, you're um, working hard there in SA like you're booked and busy booked and busy we see you you see Bingo here wow. yeah. Everywhere. You know what? Like it's still challenging, especially now with the pandemic. I feel um, so for me, like I'm actually in a space of transitioning right now. Like I'm transitioning in a lot of different areas in my life. Yeah. Uh, I'm I just moved out of my parents' house, for example. And then um I also I'm currently transitioning from having an agent to like trying to form a management team. And um, it's an interesting space to be in because uh, there's so much you start like starts going through your head, right? I remember when Cook Off went on to Netflix, and I had this great big um, anxiety about what if I okay, we won't even put it out in the in the universe. We won't even do that. But like it was one of those thoughts, like you yeah. don't want to be that person who is the first to do something, or whatever, and then. 10 years later, people are asking, I ain't done I you know what I mean? Like no one remembers yeah. if you haven't done anything. And for me, it, what was interesting was during that time, I actually found like this um, conversation that two people had. It was like an interview or something. And the one thing they said was that sometimes anxiety comes or yeah, anxiety might come up. It's not a bad thing it's usually something that prompts you to action, right? So if I'm anxious about something, Mm -hmm. then what am I going to do about it? What should I be doing about it? So that whatever bad thing I'm anticipating doesn't actually happen. So that for me was, was again, like great for me to to kind of learn. So now I'm kind of trying to build um, my brand, trying to really like make the right connections. That's the kind of like the transitioning phase I'm in, making the right connections, making sure that I'm ready for whatever's going to come now and just um, making sure that I'm in the right, um, I'm, I'm the best that I can be because sometimes I think a lot of people forget that, um, okay, now I'm just going to be talking, but um, acting for me is like, it's like the work is actually emotional Mm-hmm. like me taking care of myself is the work I don't know if I'm making sense that 100 percent makes sense to me and I try yeah like I try to say that to people as well because <laughs> because a lot of times actors actors have a lot of waiting periods or periods when you're not working sometimes mm-hmm. um, but what you do in between is actually work as well it's part of if you need to make sure you're okay, like mentally, spiritually, physically, emotionally, like you're preparing, it's like you're always in a state of preparation. Mm -hmm. And there's so much to learn about humanity, about what's happening in the world, even how you're feeling, like taking cognizance of how I'm feeling in this moment while I wait is 
actually something I can use as a tool later on in a film. You never know. Yeah. And people be like, yo, she is that scene. It's because I've been there, right? Like whatever the character is going through, I've been there. And yeah. so just learning all those things, that's kind of like the space I'm in right now. Um, and it's been very, very interesting. But so I'm not like booked and busy right now, but I am at work in different ways. And I'm, I've been working with the UNDP, like um, just before I went on this call, I was actually speaking at a conference with ECOWAS. For those of you who know, ECOWAS is like a, the SADC, the West African version, the SADC West African version of what? What am I saying? Geography, mufunge, all of geography. Oh, so you know what ego is? Ego is like no, but I get you, like West African version of Sadek, yeah. Exactly, that's what I was trying to say. And so I, I, I was speaking at a conference uh, for women in business, and so I'm excited about like the work I get to do while I'm waiting to actually be on production, mm -hmm. um, in production. So, but it's been very interesting, just kind of using my other skills and like using my other ways of thinking um, in a more like developmental kind of way. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, that's been, that's been interesting. The hundred percent makes sense. And it's kind of weird explaining to people like when they think you turn down a job to do nothing and it's like, no, not do nothing because my off time is still relevant to then my on time and it's a complete package I need to balance what comes before to come to go next because you'll burn out and then now I can't do the job properly so don't tell burn me burn out is <laughs> real and that's why I'm like I'm extra pissed about you know people who don't just respect time like if we're running three hours late say we're running three hours late because you are putting me in on mode when I'm not actually doing anything and like I could have been at home relax like relaxing and resting so I can come and like bring the most into now and yeah so I don't know it, it seems very like glamorous and like you're not doing anything you people actors you're always sipping mimosas on some cliff mansion and it's like well you know that's also because I spent like two months crying deeply every day on command <laughs> or something you know it's, it's not normal um so yeah no that's definitely I think an important thing for everybody to hear everybody yeah. creatively and also just everybody um just in any field that you're in, mm -hmm. any take, field a, that you're in. take a break mm -hmm. and it's, it's unfortunate that it had to be something like a pandemic you know and so so many people were dying and everything that people actually learned you need to take a step back make accommodations for yourself do everything that you need to do for you so you can be the best you that you want to be but um so you're saying you're transitioning now from like just step stepping back and rethinking so you go from having an agent to more of like a management team mm -hmm. how is that going um I think I'm I'm kind of torn because as much as um I feel like I'm at a point where I can still get work without an agent there are still mm -hmm. some other jobs I still need to have an agent for. Yeah. So if I really want to, for example, if I really want to be in international gigs and stuff, I probably still need an agent. Um, and having an agent is always good because um, especially if you don't have a manager, for example, you need someone to be able to negotiate your contracts, to negotiate like, you know, your work because you don't want to be the one negotiating stuff and then having to work with the same people that you were busy shouting and you know arguing yeah. about money with you know what I mean <laughs> um so just having that team around me I think for me right now is I'm just trying to have because one thing I've realized I've been com okay not comparing in a bad way but I've I've always been ever since I decided to be an actress I've always been super super aware and observant of um the people who are like me who make mm -hmm. it for example when I think of like my um my peers here in South Africa who are my age young and black talented whatever and then I look at where some of them are now and like I always have to like learn like okay so what did they do or what do they have that I don't have and mm -hmm. one thing that I've noticed about a lot of um careers that really kind of become sustainable um is that they have a good team around them 
And so for me, that's something that I really want to focus on right now, like building a good team around me. When I say team, I mean having a manager, like I said, uh, possibly still having an agent. Hopefully, if I was to get an agent, I'd love to get an international one so that I can maybe book some more international gigs um, and then um, have like maybe a PR person, someone who like helps me build a brand uh, because it's becoming so important now to be like, to to have a brand or a presence online and to have a cause that you're fighting for and just like for people to really engage with who you are. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's like, it's a lot of work. It's funny because I think when I when I was went into acting, I didn't know that there was a whole lot of other work that you do. That's not even it has nothing to do with the acting. And I, all I want to do is to act. It's like twenty percent of it. <laughs> <laughs> like showing up on set is like twenty percent of it, and then maintenance. All I, to, all I want to do is to act. Even like promoting Cook Off was such work. Like last year when it went on Netflix, I was on interviews for so long. And I was thinking to myself, no one, I mean, they, t- they tell you, you're going to have to promote the film, but th- it's actually work. work. And so that's why I was saying, you need to take care of yourself. You need to have a team around you because all these people help you to actually perform at your best, even outside of the acting. And so- And that's the thing is no one ever wants to see you not at your best. They see the highlights on the film and they expect yeah. you to always be that person, even yeah. if it's the 600th interview of the day. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> the learning, that's another learning curve, I think, for the art sector in general. This whole thing of us saying to ourselves, oh, we're just actors, nobody understands us, and we're like rebels, that has to stop. <laughs> because the truth is, for us to grow a sustainable, structured industry, we need all the help we can get. And when I say help, I mean we need lawyers, we need accountants. We need producers, like business people who actually can help us build the industry. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? We need people who have not, who don't act, who don't sing, who who are not artistically talented to help us with the administrative and structural aspects of of running an industry. And so for me, those are very important things that I've been learning and I'm hoping to continue advocating for. Yes. Yeah. No, definitely. We, um, and a few people are doing some of that work and it's and it's good work but it's um like you meant like you're mentioning you just need someone with an outside perspective who's not viewing everyone as my brother and sister and the suffering and that <laughs> it's business and it, you need to be and that's what it's been a running theme on this podcast is we just need to be commercialized it is it is a career i'm supposed to be paying bills off of this i'm gonna have to end up paying tax off of this um, yes come come with the right mindset and yeah. even if you are capable of doing all of it have someone else who also has much better business acumen because that's also a running theme with artists is signing contracts and then you sign away so much more than you didn't realize because you and that's not the same person you're going to want to then go have to deal with as and you have to and like the circles are, especially in zim the circles are still kind of small right so you have mm. If that falls apart, you have nowhere to go. You have nothing to terrible. move forward from. Yeah. But mm-hmm. so you want to have a, a separate management team and everything, even though, and you're recognizing it's important, even though that's something that you yourself are quite good at naturally. And that's something that you do. No. To be honest, like I, I think for a long time, like so far, to be honest, I still don't have the team So I have been doing it myself. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, you can't do everything by yourself. This is when I burnt out last year. Last year, I was so burnt out, Munya. I was burnt out. (laughs) So I realized, you know, as much as I probably have the tools to do it myself, but I really have to get the help that I need Mm -hmm. so that, um, like you said, I can still perform at my best with other things because someone else is dealing with the other stuff you know what I mean so that I'm just a balanced human being and I have time to be with friends I have time to to rest I have time to read a book I don't know you know so so as much as you can do it yourself I think it's important to still have somebody even if it's not like it doesn't have to be 20 people it could just be two or three people Mm -hmm. who are 
helping you with the various things that you need to to get done yeah. and I, I like I said I'm not there yet I'm still scouting and negotiating and looking but I'm getting there I'm finding people um, who are interested although I must say there's a huge gap and when it comes to talent management in Zimbabwe yeah. I think the music industry or the music sector is a bit better a lot of people are really sure. always open to manage people who are singing but when it comes to actors, it's like, it's so hard to persuade someone to manage you. I don't know. And that's what you're saying. Like, we don't really know. Like you're saying, we are too much defining ourselves by the, the suffering. And which is definitely like a huge part of our stories. Nobody understands my dark soul, whatever. But like, think more commercially. And, you know, there's something we talk about in comedy as well. And it's just not, we're not there yet. But that's also... I was going to say, like, trying to have a management team, it's also, like, a hidden cost. A lot of a hidden cost, a lot of artists, like, don't realise. You're like, oh, these people get paid millions. And it's like, well, okay, well, they also lose millions, too. Yeah. yeah. You have to pay your team. You have to pay the people helping you get where you need to go. But, like, um, you're saying, reach out to who you can and start together. Because an important team, a good team is, you know, people you've started out with who know yeah. you and are going to be able to sift out all the nonsense as you... Um, get more relevant I suppose and get more and more True. work and yeah. if there's if there's that gap that's great because then the two of you can grow together and create new models for things that because we can't always necessarily follow a Hollywood model or follow Nollywood or Bollywood model so it's great to have that coming from nothing so create something yeah I, I totally totally agree with you I'm excited oh. yeah, it well, is exciting so, and like, it's, it's amazing you have these smarts because you've received good mentorship and like you're paying that forward in everything that you're saying and like what you're trying to do. And, you know, you're speaking to the Ecos girls and then, but also you yourself, you've made sure to invest in the business side of yourself to see yourself as I am a business. And that's a bit weird to see yourself as an individual because the whole thing is you're an artist, don't sell yourself to capitalism, but like the world is the world. <laughs> How are you going to pay the bills? You know, you know, how are you going to get to the audition in the first place if they're suddenly like, we're promoting how you're going to get yourself to the Hollywood red carpet? How are you going to drink? You can't just go, apparently, you, can't, you know, you can't just go dressed as with whatever you have to be wearing someone and promoting this and promoting that. And you loaned a $4,000 pair of earrings. And yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you've definitely, yeah, so, like, tell us more about that and, like, what, just that paradigm shift that you are continuing to have in your transition period of just the importance of viewing yourself as a business and not just investing in yourself personally and investing in yourself commercially, but bringing all of that together to make you a marketable professional. You know, the way I'm thinking of it now, mm -hmm. um, is actually bigger than me. Because mm -hmm. what I realize is, you know, a lot of um, American media, it's, it's, a, it's a term that I discovered when I was doing my, my business degree. Mm -hmm. And I decided, cause I'm so stubborn, I decided to do my a business thesis on film, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so I wrote a, a thesis about how, how countries can brand themselves using film, right? Because what I realized is that a lot of like American TV, even the way I'm talking right now, ugh, influence from the America. You know what I mean? Like, honestly, like, 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 hello. Oh, so annoying. But you see exactly that is that we've been influenced so much by mm -hmm. the United States of America that they have, what we call soft power, right? So it's that an intangible influence that a country has over international players, right? So I, when, when I was growing up, all I wanted to do was to visit the States. Uh, I would love to, I mean, now obviously with the internet and with all the stuff that we know about America now, maybe things have changed, but more like, no, actually I want to stay in Africa or whatever. I know because there's so many yeah. problems there or whatever. But because of the influence they've had over us in media, and the stars that we used to see, <laughs> a 
and the stars that we used to see. And I'm not saying yeah. America is bad. I'm just mm. saying that they're actually really good at selling themselves. I was right? literally thinking this yesterday and I was watching a reality show and like just the way they like flash different scenes of things. I'm like, that's, that's a whole vehicle for an aesthetic that we haven't quite grasped yet sometimes. Exactly. Some our films as well. Exactly. So basically, it's not that America is bad. America is great because they do what they do. They tell good stories. They tell mm. stories that create and shape the narratives that they want the world to see about them. And that is, mm. that is amazing. You know what I mean? So for me, and then also my point was we get to see the stars. So we get to see the Hollywood stars and we emulate them and you know we see their lifestyle we follow them the we want to be like them those that that's like the standard of like what a successful American dream looks like mm -hmm. and then for me so now when I look at me now and I'm asking myself but what is my dream like what is my what is the African dream what yeah. do I want to see so when I if I was to go uh and you know to the Oscars who would I wear? Would I wear an African brand? Would I be holding um, a bag made by an African designer? Mm -hmm. Because what I, what ends up happening is, yes, I am a business, but who is it? Who am I selling? You know what I mean? I'm selling me, yes, but am I also selling Africa? Am I selling African brands, African, the African narrative? What does yeah. that narrative say? Who are we? Um, you know, all these things that so it's bigger than me it's not just about me it's about who I represent as as an actress as a person as an African um and the story I'm trying to tell and the identities I'm hoping to help shape by just being on those platforms um and I mean people like Lupita Nyong'o people like Nanai Gurira they've been doing such a good job with that in really trying to um, represent us on big stage on big platforms and stages yeah so, but it's, at the end of the day, it's about, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a topic that's bigger than us. Yes, we're a business. Yes, we want to make money. But we also need to be conscious of what it is exactly we're selling and how mm -hmm. we're selling it. So, yes, I do see myself as a business. And um, I've been learning a lot about how we can use storytelling to really shape perceptions. And so as I'm selling myself, I'm really conscious of that. And I'm like, okay this is the narrative I want to, to, to give to the world, especially as an African young woman. Um, so yeah, that's where I am in my headspace about the business thing. And also I like what you said um, earlier about how you know, the arts need to be commercialized because that's exactly what I was saying uh, at this conference is that I'm, I'm trying to help people understand or businesses understand in Africa especially that there's a huge opportunity now that African content is in demand. There's a huge opportunity for businesses to brand and market themselves on these platforms, like yep. through content creation, right? So if there's a huge film that Netflix is doing, how can brands tap into that, you know, and have brand placement in the films? Because, you know, these films are not just being watched by local people, African people, mm -hmm. they're being watched by the globe. And if in these stories, we are using African products, representing African brands, and, and not in a very like obvious way, because you know how these American Hollywood uh, films do it. It's just normal life. Like they, but yeah. they've got all these American brands in these films, right? Same Sweden thing. Them, yeah. If we were to do that and normalize local brands or African brands in our films, in our media, in our content, it would definitely like sell brands. It would spotlight the African brands in a way that is palatable and that it, in a way that is uh, relatable to the everyday person. So for me, I'm really, like you said, trying to help this bridge of the, the arts and storytelling um, and bridge it with commerce. And really, because that's another thing is that the reason why we don't have a lot of funding or money in the arts is because we haven't really tapped into commerce. We haven't tapped into uh, servicing these businesses that do have money, that can give us money. In South Africa, the advertising industry is so big. If a filmmaker doesn't have work in terms of film, they can definitely try their hand at, at commercials and they will make a living, they will be able to survive because businesses understand that the South African audiences are always watching TV um, they're always watching content. So they will 
you know, they will do a lot of commercials. They will entertain the people with their commercials. I think South Africa is really, really great at, <laughs> at making commercials. Um, I, but I it's because that. it's actually I, filmmakers who are making those commercials. It's storytellers who are making commercials. It's um, so good. Yeah. It's usually it goes you think professional it's actors, professional mm-hmm. filmmakers making commercials for, for businesses and brands. And that's why they're so good. Um, so if more businesses in Africa and more um, companies can just tap into that, here in Africa, I think it would really support the arts industry more. Yeah, no, yeah. for sure. Uh, sorry, when you when you're talking about um, the product placement and everything, I read somewhere that the the latest Bond movie, I think they had, at the time of shooting, they had all the latest gadgets and everything and everything. And then COVID happened and there was just like a huge, obviously now gap in the production schedule. So now by the time the film's going to be ready to go out, there's been a new phone, there's been a new everything, and it is just blowing wide the entire CGI budget because they now have to go over every single gadget. With the fix and I was like, updates. What a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> nightmare. It is a nightmare. Like, wow. I, like, good but you have to be relevant, nightmare. you know? Yeah, so it, I just remember what you mentioned about, you know, it's partnerships with, with everything, the business yeah. partnership of the marketing and the and this and telling the narratives. And I love that at the center of everything that you do, you have storytelling at the at the crux of it. You don't just get your MBA and then toddle off to make a bunch of millions on the stock market or whatever. Um, you're using, even in your work in, in marketing or in, like in acting and everything else that you do, you're trying to push forward responsible narratives that are grounded in reality but also have a sense of aspiration of where we want to be and that's I think that's a huge different uh, difference in in storytelling and that's I don't know to me that's how you end up with um just something slightly better as a storyteller as a because that's the point of telling your friend something versus a whole feature play it's not, yes, it's the technical things in the story, but it's just drawing out the best of the things and then adding that extra that that aspiration. So yeah. you add little lifestyle shots, even though on the ground, it doesn't even look like that. You just took the one picture at the angle and didn't show the like dustbins right next to it or something. <laughs> but everything, just weaving that together, because not only does it give you know, the rest of the world a good um, perception, but it gives those of us who are represented just... A little light just better than real life just a little Mm. something else to set our eyes above to and I think sometimes some of our stories and our productions are very on the just very it's just a mirror it's just a flat mirror put against the ground and just reflecting everything back so you haven't had a story you haven't had anything that you wouldn't have had from just interacting with your family or anything and I definitely love that about cook off because of course it's Bob when you're watching it you're like "Mm, I've got a name back on that <laughs> that's not the point you want something nice to elevate everybody's level of thinking and elevate the story and elevate the perception and you know I was like oh, if I met Shingai I would not be that calm at all at all shame I was like that is <laughs> if she's not a singing no, which in the story he just didn't know he would have I been would screaming. Say, I would I would have fainted. I would have woken up in the avenues. But like that's the and I was like, she also wouldn't have started randomly singing in the middle of, but you know. Um, but I love that you've highlighted that. And that's definitely I that's definitely a huge takeaway for me as well. And to bring to other people that our stories aren't just a flat reflection of everything you want to see. You have to use put some contour in there and flesh it out into something to aspire to into a perception that you are into a narrative that we're weaving all together Mm. because that's exactly how um these more advanced industries and everything have have done Mm. you take control of your narratives and you shape them even if it's not what's on the ground i mean there is in my in my in my research i did mention and this was an advice this was advice to like the governments and the powers that be, right? Mm -hmm. Is that as much as, even as a filmmaker, I don't want to paint a picture that can never become reality, sorry. Mm -hmm. I don't want to paint a picture that can never actually be there 
in reality. Mm -hmm. I want to paint pictures of things that we can aspire to and that we can actually see yes. tangibly. For example, like Black Panther, I loved Black Panther. And it got me thinking about how, just how far is Africa or an African you know, space or an African continent? How far are we from becoming the world's most advanced technologically you know, space yeah. or country? Like how far are we from that reality? And the honest truth is we are very, very far. Yeah. Right. Because Wakanda in Black Panther is like this technologically advanced space uh, or place. And so, but how far are we? And then the smartest, uh, most, uh, the smartest engineer in Wakanda was a woman, was a girl, Shuri. You know what I mean? Like for me, mm -hmm. those are very aspirational kinds of, th that's an aspirational narrative. But how far are we from that? And the point isn't to sell dreams. The point is to, to, to say, yes, this is what we're aspiring to. How can we make mm -hmm. it happen? How then practically can governments, can industries kind of create mm -hmm. the Africa we want to see? How could we make our dreams come true? Can Africa be a place that I can have my dreams come true? That's a yeah. question I'm posing, you know, to all these people. Can this be the place or do I have to leave? Tell me now, do I have to leave and go to the States for my dreams to come true? Or can, can the African dream come true? And what do we need to be doing to make it come true? So that even as a filmmaker, as a storyteller, I'm not selling people dreams. I'm not lying. It's oh, an aspiration sure, yeah. that we're working towards. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I would love mm -hmm. to see that our potential becoming a reality. So, um, yeah. So it's something that I did mention because there's always, you need to have a balance. As mm -hmm. much as I want to create this narrative, I hope I'm inspiring people to action. I'm not inspiring people to just wishful thinking. You know what I mean? For sure, yeah. Like set, sort of like you want something reflecting not just the base of what like what's on the ground and something not way up there, but just something slightly above, something to set your eyes to as you're going forward, something to work towards. But I was gonna say with the with the Wakanda thing, um, because there were lots of, there was like lots of takeaways from that, right? So it might not be the exact literal um, example of the taking of the technology and everything, but just, um, but again, this is still also very dif distant of have, just having our own customs and our own ways of thinking. And within them, there was also a kind of socialism that worked for everybody. So how far are we? from that and that's definitely obviously a huge very very far away but um yeah yeah mm. but I do feel you yeah, and that was a lot of uh people's issues with some of these films is it's it's too it's either black trauma or it's it's poverty like pandering too much to people wanting to see poverty or it's just way, way out of reach so I understand like and that's what I liked about Cook off. It was like um, with the sets, especially with the in betweens and the stories. It was like I want to have this, and I can work towards it, even though that's definitely not what's on the ground. But it wasn't, and then it wasn't super. And then um, Anesu wins, and then she they live happily ever after, and then she builds this huge mansion, and then everybody turned out to have been alive the whole time, and it's just not, it's just not realistic. <laughs> Listen, like, girl. I don't, I don't know. I, I, to be honest, I'm a very aspirational person and mm. I'm actually trying to work on a script right now about going to space. Like I am so for like doing things out of the, out of this world. Yes. Like, I'm not saying like we shouldn't dream big. I'm mm. just saying, please, can my dreams come true? Like whoever can make it yeah. happen. If you're a government, if you're an industry, if you are someone with the powers to try to make our reality as young people come to, I mean, our dreams come true, then please do something about it. Like, nice. I feel, yeah. So go, like, for example, I would love to see an African made spaceship going to space. That would be really cool. You know what I mean? Like, why not? But do um, we have fuel? That's the thing. Yeah, we like, whatever fuel. needs to be sorted out, needs to be sorted out because this is what we want. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean. like, so these are our dreams this is where we want to go so how can we practically yeah. 
make it happen like it's not i don't think it's impossible it might be mm-hmm. maybe 20 years from now or 10 who knows maybe five i don't know yeah. but the point for us to dream is so that we can work towards the dream even awesome. if they are very outside of the box so because you don't want to put limits to people's dreams right you don't want to put limits mm-hmm. to people's imagination because anything is possible you never know you never know what's possible um, just like how people would probably didn't think that any Zimbabwean production would ever be on Netflix, but hello, you know, here we are. So you just never know. But the point is that as we are dreaming, let's make it our reality. Let's try to, to have active plans, active resources in place, active, you know, um, dialogue that helps us to reach whatever it is that we're imagining in our heads or else yeah. it's just pointless for us to be wish to be thinking wishfully all the time yeah and i always say like there's a lot of great conversations that happen but at the end of it i'm like okay but what actionable thing Action. did we Action. take away from this because i don't want to be back here next week having this exact same conversation <laughs> like i just wish xyz and then and then and then um yeah, I, don't, I mean, I say this as somebody who will frequently be like, when you get your life in order, and then tomorrow, like, I still haven't folded my laundry. And I was like, well, <laughs> you had an actionable thing there. What did you do? But, um, but then this is why it's important to have the integration of different people in different mm-hmm. industries, because then we can be the dreamers, right? We're the storytellers. Our job is to actually imagine and put out the stories. But it's someone else's job, I think, to build an industry, to build systems in place, to do all these yeah. things, you know, the practical hands on of what, how to run a country or how to run an industry or how to do the work is someone else. And so we need to work together. We can't operate in silos. The whole thing of the creative sector is over there and then it the decision make makers sense. are over there. It's like... It's like, that complicated, like the complicated relationship between like architects and then civil engineers. It was just a bunch of dreams and that's not going to happen, but working towards, and then we have something nice that everybody got to put a piece of themselves. Exactly. um, And yeah, just even reading about other, other, you know, industries in other countries, you'd be shocked what industries actually have very intricate and intimate relationships that you would never think would intersect with the arts industry or anything like that. They've been in these partnerships for so, for so, so long. So I guess, yeah, so we need to have aspirational, be move in an aspirational manner, but realistic, something targetable, a goal, and cross, cross-sectional cross productions, cross sec, cr- just cross-sectionality in everything that we're doing to move forward. Because like you're saying, there's no point also in one thing making progress and one little sector making progress, and then the others are dragging behind because it just, it just doesn't work. Yeah, and that's, I love that that's a big thing that you push forward, like, because accountability doesn't work if it's just a little, a little section, everybody across the board needs to be accountable for all of our progress together, otherwise, I've finished the data. Nope. I've finished the data. Not even like, even if you don't have like a strongest, you're only strong as the weakest link kind of mindset, but even if you're just more of the majority, we have to take each of us there. Yeah. So on that next red carpet, and I was on the plus one. <laughs> you know, they must just give me like a plus ten because I have so many people who would want to come with me. It should just be a provision. I feel like for people coming from black families, just be like, okay, so I have plus ten, and then just add an extra five chairs because by now I'm going to sit on the floor. Exactly. And so someone I'm might just show up. You never know. <laughs> Like 30 of you at the airport to say goodbye to one person. <laughs> I love it. So, I love it so much. Like the community, the, so you know, it's just so, it's so good. Um, I love it. So yeah, no, I'm, I'm actually just praying and hoping that, you know, that even happens. Mm-hmm. Um, just praying and hoping for more work, for more um, interesting work and mm-hmm. international work, something that has, huge impact like I really want more of that kind of work so yeah I'm just working towards it and praying for it to happen yes and yeah no you're working hard you're working hard and taking care of yourself so that you can better (laughs) represent the people whose stories you're telling as well Um, and better represent yourself as well you know 
be yeah. there for you. Oh, I like that. I like that. It's like, um, and I think that's something that not a lot of women learn um, mm -hmm. early enough in life that like, it's not being selfish. You're taking care of you so you can better take care of other people. Like, gotta take care of their that vehicle. That is poetry to my ears. <laughs> that is good to, oh my gosh. You just don't learn that at all. It's like servicing no, the car. You like, yes, you're pausing. And sometimes people will guilt it, trip you. They will, they will. People will make you feel bad for taking a break. And you're like, but, and until you fall sick or something and they're like, ah, what are you it's like, that could have been avoided if a person had just been taking breaks or sharing yeah. the load, you know, but I think we're learning. I think our generation definitely we've kind of caught on to the issue of self-care and self-love. Oh, it's, it's a thing, right? Yes. Um, and that's really important. I, I believe even my own mom the other day was saying to me that she's definitely feeling like of late, she's been taking care of herself more than she's ever been in her entire life. Um, but it's like more of a realization after like what, 60 years of living. Right? Yeah. Um, but she was just like, yeah, she understands. So I was like, yes, <laughs> power to the women. Right, <laughs> go for it. Go for it. All right, yeah. well, I'm excited to, to see what else you do, not just like internationally, please go. Thank you. Home, even just back home as well. Cause it's, it's always nice as well when you have a mix of, you have bringing in your fresh perspective, we're bringing in what we've been doing here and we're just creating a new, a new style, a new, and there's always room. There's honestly always room. And yes, you might have to kick and punch and scream for your room, but there's definitely always room. And that's- Can I just say, um, you know, the few productions I've done in Zim have always been so inspiring. Like I have the utmost respect for um, practitioners in Zimbabwe because it's not an easy environment to be in and the fact that you are still here doing anything in the arts like I mean yes. if only people understood just how hard it is and the fact that people have continued to follow their dreams and to follow their paths even when it's so difficult to do so is mm -hmm. completely inspiring to me I remember when we shot cook off and I was there thinking to myself this is like guerrilla style shooting and but these people are so dedicated they are so invested in making it work I was so inspired and I said to myself I have no excuse whatsoever coming from a people like this you know not to push not I can't say I will give up give up what when these people I, I'm, I'm yeah. just so so inspired by Zimbabwean um, you know artists who are still living in Zimbabwe because it's not an easy environment and I'm I'm just so grateful for the work that you are doing. And even this platform, the fact that, you know, you're doing this work is so inspiring and I'm so happy to have been a part of this. Yeah. Thank you so, so much for, for coming on. It's really, I, I'm really happy as well, always to just thinking about the fellowship that it's just something that wasn't there for a lot of people. And like the fact that we now have enough mentors and everyone to just bring it up together from the grassroots, teach each other what we know. And thank you for taking the time out to from i mean hmm, sipping your mimosas on your cliffside mat i'm joking um, <laughs> actors over there i mean the I mean, up on table mountain we don't know i'm kidding um I'm in <laughs> oh okay. i don't know some million story skyscraper actors oh, life wow. <laughs> Um, but it's just, it's just really great that we're all coming together to, like you're saying, just work towards the same vision with actionable things, people taking time to talk, um, having this fellowship, starting it, having the students come in and just everybody working together to make something happen. And that's definitely been a theme again in the podcast, just like come together and let's do what we can with what we have. You just never know where we'll end up and we'll create something much better than if each person is struggling on their own. So thank you so much tonight for talking to us here on the AL. Oh, you're so welcome, Munya. It was so lovely. Oh, I mean, I learned so much. I'm excited, girl. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. All right. Thank you guys so much for joining us. This has been the Friday Film Podcast. We will catch you next week, same time. This has been Tendai Shichitima. Please catch her on, on Netflix. 
um, the cook-off and in a bunch of other productions um, as she does more and lets us know. Oh, sorry, what are your socials so people can? Yeah, on Instagram and on Twitter, I'm at Tendai uh, without a Y. So just Tendai without a Y underscore Chitima. Um, that's my Twitter and my Instagram. Those are the two I'm mostly active on, so lovely stuff and then we can definitely see get the tips get the tips on the branding get the tips on taking care of yourself get the tips on telling our stories responsibly thank you guys so much for watching and we'll see you next time